Good evening, everyone. I'm David Israelovitz, the chair of the J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee, and I want to welcome uh, Dr. Lewis and all of you tonight to our 50th annual JRO Memorial Lecture. We dedicate We dedicate tonight's lecture to the memory of Leon Heller, a member of our committee for 26 years, who served actively in our committee until his recent passing at the age of 93. As our older committee members have passed on, we have a new generation of members who have taken up our work with enthusiasm. I thank the 21 members of the Oppenheimer... Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank the 21 members of the Upper Harbor Committee who have uh, designed our logo <laughs> and who have worked incredibly hard to bring us this event tonight and also our many other activities. Our committee began in 1971 when John Broly realized more was needed to be done to honor J. Robert Oppenheimer, director of Project Y during the Manhattan Project and the founder of Modern Los Alamos. Oppenheimer had been humiliated in the throes of McCarthyism, and his security clearance was revoked after a contrived and unfair set of hearings where he was forced to defend himself and his reputation after leading one of the great scientific and national security achievements of our time. Eventually, the committee determined that one way to honor and preserve Oppenheimer's memory and his many contributions to science and national security was to organize an annual lecture by an eminent scholar, the latest of which we will enjoy tonight. In addition to these lectures, our committee provides scholarships to promising students from local high schools, and this year we awarded 15 scholarships totaling $47,000, bringing the grand total to over $753,000 since our program began in 1984. We also support other science events in the area to encourage and recognize our talented youth. It is fitting that we recognize this year's scholarship winners. And I apologize, could we have the light, the, the theater lights on for just a second, please? Um, if you are one of our scholarship winners, please stand when your name is called. And will the audience please hold their applause until we have read all the names. So from Santa Fe High School, Lucas Blakesley, Jacob Mirabal, please, please, Lucas, you can keep standing, yeah. Jacob Mirabal, Justin Mirabal, Nathaniel Steiger, Isel Aragon Miramontes, Viviana Ormelas, Leslie Garcia Sosa, um, those, uh, uh, she's from uh, Capitol High School. And then from Los Alamos High School, Jean Wu Park, Madeline Kratzer, Sonja Ebe, Adeline Fang, Isaac Gao, Quinton Geller, Violet Henderson, and Ming Wang Lo. So, congratulations and best of luck to our staff. We could have the room lights again. So why are we all sitting here tonight? Why is Los Alamos here? Let's look back to 1922 when 18-year-old Robert Oppenheimer was in frail health in New York City. His parents thought some time in the Southwest would restore him. By a simple twist of fate, Oppenheimer's rehabilitation began in the shadow of the beautiful Sangre de Cristo Mountains and he fell in love with northern New Mexico. He always said that his two great loves were physics and New Mexico. When it came time to find a remote site relatively easy to secure, where some of the world's greatest scientists could come together for a challenging but vital secret program, Oppenheimer remembered his youth here, and the rest, as they say, is history. 
But years later, we have to admit that Oppenheimer lamented, I'm responsible for ruining a beautiful place. The memory of the injustice suffered by Dr. Oppenheimer in 1954 never left the thoughts of historians, national leaders, and indeed the Los Alamos community. Led by Mary Lou Williams and other members of our committee, we participated in a national effort to have this injustice corrected. So we were delighted when late last year, Secretary of Energy Jennifer Granholm issued an order vacating the 1954 Atomic Energy Commission decision in the matter of J. Robert Oppenheimer. Many individuals and organizations wrote supportive letters to the Secretary and deserve our gratitude, including biographers, historians, and academics. Our Los Alamos County Council passed a resolution in support of the effort. Very influential was a letter of support signed by 43 U.S. Senators across the political spectrum. Also of critical importance was correspondence bearing the signatures of all living, current, and past, and past LANEL directors, as well as many other laboratory directors across the Department of Energy complex. I am delighted to share that this letter was composed and circulated under the leadership of our very own LANEL director, Tom Mason. So on behalf of our committee, I want to recognize and thank Dr. Mason for his personal contributions to all our efforts in the interest of justice and fairness toward Oppenheimer. And I now invite him to introduce tonight's distinguished speaker. Thank you. Well, thank you, David. Uh, it's my great honor and pleasure to introduce our speaker this evening. Professor Jennifer Lewis is a world-renowned expert in 3D printing. Among other major accomplishments, she and her team have developed new classes of soft functional inks for pen-on-paper electronics, flexible electronics and 3D antennas. They've also demonstrated a new route for creating shape-morphing architectures known as biomimetic 4D printing, to underpin these efforts, she leads a large multidisciplinary research group that brings together fundamental expertise in soft matter, microfluidics, and additive manufacturing. Given her broad range of research, she is active in adaptive material technologies, bio-inspired robotics, programmable nanomaterials, and in many more emerging areas. Professor Lewis is the Jian Ming Yu Professor of Arts and Sciences and the Vice Professor of Biologically Inspired Engineering as well as a core faculty member of the Wies Institute at Harvard University. She currently directs the Harvard Materials Research Science and Engineering Center and serves as the Bioengineering Area Chair in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Since earning her doctorate in ceramic science from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, she has received numerous awards, including election to the National Academy of Sciences and Engineering, National Science Foundation Presidential Faculty Fellow Award, Langmuir Lecture Award from the American Chemical Society, the Vannevar Bush National Security Science and Engineering Faculty Fellow Award from the Department of Defense, the Materials Research Society Medal Award, and the Lush Science Prize for research that will help to eliminate animal testing. She's also a fellow of the American Ceramic Society, American Physical Society, Materials Research Society, Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the National Academy of Inventors. Her work on microscale 3D printing was highlighted as one of the 10 breakthrough technologies by MIT's Technology Review, while her Briya printing research was named one of the top 100 science stories by Discover Magazine. She's written more than 200 papers and holds 30 patents. In addition, she's co-founder of two companies that are commercializing technology from her lab. The title of her talk today is Printing Soft Objects, actually it's here, slightly different, Soft Objects and Functional Tissues, I'm confident that you will find this discussion both informative and inspiring. Please join me in welcoming, welcoming Professor Jennifer Lewis. <laughs> no one knows what you're doing. 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I want to begin by thanking the Oppenheimer Memorial Committee for bestowing this honor on me, for selecting me to, to give tonight's lecture, and really for their incredible hospitality over the last two days. It's been a pleasure to meet all of the members and also the high school scholarship winners. Um, they're off to a terrific start, I can tell, and I'm looking forward to seeing how the next four years go for them. I'd also like to talk, thank Tom Mason for his generous and uh, very long <laughs> introduction, um, which I never feel I deserve, but thank you so much for, for your kindness. Um, it's, it's, as uh, Tom said, tonight I'm going to talk about printing uh, soft objects and functional tissues. Um, this is work that's really spanned over many many years, and I'm going to try to just highlight four key advances that we've made in, in our lab. Uh, but before I begin, I just want to set the stage. I think most people know uh, what 3D printing is. It's a digital fabrication method, and it really has uh, caught and captured uh, the attention of, of the, the layperson, uh, because over the last uh, you know, 12 to, to 13 years, um, the advent of desktop 3D printers, uh, this so-called printer in every home, has made it a, a very ubiquitous platform. But what's exciting about 3D printing is the fact that you can take an idea, create a digital design, and then rapidly transform that into a three-dimensional object. And this you know, eliminates the need for expensive dyes, molds and tooling, which are costly. And as you can see, uh, as I go through these examples, would, would prohibit things like mass customization. From a material scientist perspective, I'm excited about 3D printing because I believe it has the potential and often allows for unprecedented control over the local composition, structure, and properties of the materials that we're printing. So let me just give a few examples of why this technology is growing and I think will grow exponentially over the next decade. The first is that complexity is free. So when you have a 3D printer, essentially you can design any kind of part with um, complex shapes that you could not make by traditional manufacturing methods. They're simply not possible to make this fuel injector that I'm showing here. Uh, in fact, when GE made this part originally, it took 20 individual parts to make this part that pre 3D printing can do in one shot. Um, the other thing that's nice about 3D printing in this design is it led to a 25% weight production. And GE is using this uh, fuel injector in their LEAP engine and they print roughly 20,000 parts a year. Now from the perspective of offering unprecedented control, this is an example actually from Julia Greer's lab at Caltech, which I just couldn't help but presenting because, I mean, this architecture has a density a thousand times less than water. Think about that for a minute. It's a metallic architecture, it's an octet truss, but as you can see here, each one of these struts is hollow. It's a very thin shell of metal, and that's what gives it its incredibly lightweight properties. And then from the perspective of you know, using this as a, a manufacturing method for mass customization, uh, for those of you who wear uh, ortho orthodontics or have in-the-ear hearing aids, those are all 3D printed. So uh, if we think about some of the printing methods that can be used to form the parts that I just showed you, there are both light and ink-based printing methods. Um, in all of these cases, you're either using light to solidify material locally, or you're depositing material in the form of an ink locally and building up a structure layer by layer. Um, in this case, this is a, a powder bed fusion process where you're using a laser to locally fuse together either metal particles or plastic particles. In stereolithography, you use a laser to locally polymerize a resin of, of, of material that is polymerizable and solidifies only where the laser shines light. And in fused deposition modeling, you're, you're taking a monofilament of a solid polymer and you're introducing it into a hot head where it locally melts and then you pattern that material layer by layer. In all of these cases, you need a support material whether it's the powder bed, the liquid resin in which the parts are being formed, this is the hearing aid shell with some support structure as you see, or here in this lattice architecture where there's co-printing of a sacrificial or support structure that has to be removed. Now, in all of those cases, really what is at the heart of it is the form. 
Okay, the materials are used to shape. The 3D printer is used to shape these materials, but it's really based on form. And our lab has, has been focusing on how do we take 3D printing to the next level? How do we introduce or integrate, if you will, both form and function? And I would posit that the way to do this is to have new multi-material printing methods and new printable materials that are functional, structural, and biological in nature. If we think about what 3D printing has done to date with respect to form, you can see that it originated four decades ago really as a prototyping platform and a platform to make models so that designers could see like if they're designing a, a, a door opener for a BMW, what would that feel like? What does that look like? It's not the functional part, it's just a model. But more recently, they've been used to make consumer products, as I've just introduced, between the hearing aids and, and things like Invisalign orthodontics. Um, but if you look below the iceberg, so this is really form is, in my opinion, the tip of the iceberg. If you look below the iceberg, there's a myriad of things that 3D printing can help you realize. And today I'm gonna highlight three examples. Um, one is in, in batteries. How can we use 3D printing to actually create rechargeable lithium ion batteries? The other one is in soft electronics. And I'm gonna show you some things in soft robotics as well. And then lastly, I'm gonna talk about our work to create and print human tissues with the ultimate goal of creating human organs. So the techniques that we have pioneered um, involve two methods. Direct ink writing, and I've understood that Lauren, uh, Los Alamos National Lab has a, has a group that's focusing on direct ink writing, as well as embedded 3D printing. Now what you should see from this movie playing here, it, and this one as well, is that these inks are tailored so that they come out in a filamentary form. And as they span, as they are printed in this filamentary form, in this case of direct ink writing, they have uh, properties that I'll describe that allow them to span gaps in the underlying layer without the need for a support structure. However, in embedded 3D printing, we only print the features that are of interest, and we print them deep into a matrix. And that matrix does provide support, much like the other techniques that I've introduced. This is actually a vascular tree, and I'll come back to embedded printing when I talk about functional tissues. But for the first part of my talk, I'm really going to uh, focus on this direct ink writing method. As I said earlier, we really need a, a printing platform that's amenable for a wide variety of materials. Functional materials, structural materials, biological materials. And these two methods uniquely allow us to do this in a multi-material way. So for those of you who um, you know, want to understand the rheology that allows us to print these filaments, rather than having the, a viscous fluid that breaks up into droplets, much like you would have for inkjet printing, we have to think about this term viscoelasticity. So on two ends of the spectrum here, we have low viscosity viscous fluids that, as I said, break up into droplets when they would exit a print head. And then we have elastic solids, like our rubber bands. We can stretch them, but the minute, the minute we let them go, they recover to their initial length. But viscoelastic fluids, like those who I hope everyone in the audience have used today in the form of toothpaste, um, allow you to you know, print a filament and it doesn't flow and wet and spread on your brush, it stays in place. So why does that happen? Well, under the applied pressure when you squeeze your toothpaste tube, it flows like a liquid, and that's the viscous part. But when it ends up on your brush, it acts like an elastic solid, it stays in place. And essentially, that's the same kind of rheology that we want to build into these viscoelastic inks and matrices. So for those of you who have any familiarity with, real, with rheological properties, I just want to show what that means in practice. This is the viscosity of the ink as a function of shear rate. The faster we squeeze, the higher the shear rate, the easier it is to flow. Viscous fluids, of course, flow immediately upon any shear. For, to, in order to have these viscoelastic fluids flow, we have to exceed their shear yield stress. So we need a critical pressure before the toothpaste will flow. Or think about your ketchup bottle, right? You have to really kind of get it going with some sort of vigorous shaking before it flows. However, once this ink exits the nozzle, it returns to a solid-like condition, and that's the elastic part. 
So let's think about how we can create printable inks and matrices out of functional, structural, and biological building blocks. These are mechanically soft, they're deformable, yet they're also solid-like, as I've just described. So I'd like to begin with one example on functional inks that are based on particles. These are fine particles. In this case, they're a micron in size, colloidal in nature. And as you can see here, we've created these in such a way that they have these fluorescent cores. And we can image them using confocal microscopy deep into the ink so that we understand the structure, the microstructure at this particle scale. And we render these particles attractive so they stick together and they form these clusters rather than staying individually suspended and undergoing Brownian motion, diffusive thermal motion. And so as you can see, these clusters are interconnected across this entire ink and they're connected by little uh, bonds between various clusters. So these particles are attracted, they stick together. Now as I've already showed with that early uh, demo, uh, we can print filaments, but we can also print filaments out of plane. Um, and this is actually a conductive silver electrode being printed out of plane through a 30 micron nozzle. Just to give you a figure of merit, the width of a single strand of human hair is roughly three times larger, 100 microns. Now let's look deep inside this nozzle and ask ourselves, what's happening to this particle ink as we're printing? It turns out that these individual clusters, as they're sheared, as we apply pressure, start to break up and they flow. But the minute, as I showed earlier, the minute it comes out of the no nozzle, it goes back into this attractive, space-filling, solid-like system, which allows it to keep its shape. So let's start with particle-based inks and use these to create printed batteries. Um, I want to begin just by giving a brief primer on rechargeable uh, uh, lithium ion batteries. This is actually taken from Nate Lewis at Caltech. And as we use batteries in our everyday advice, uh, devices, we are, should be familiar with how they work. Um, we have an anode and a cathode in an electrical circuit. We draw electricity from the battery when we use our devices, and then we recharge the battery when we plug it back into the wall, the devices back into the wall. And in, in this process of charging and discharging, we have lithium ions, which is why it's called a lithium ion battery, and electrons that are moving either from the anode to the cathode or the cathode to the anode. And the electrons are moving through the electrical circuitry. So um, this is such an important invention that three scientists shown here won the Nobel Prize in 2019 for the discovery of lithium ion batteries. And I think everyone understands their ubiquity in our everyday lives, from hearing aids to our uh, earbuds or our Apple AirPods to our cell phones and laptops that we use to electrical vehicles. Now, if we look at the types of uh, batteries that are being used in these, in these uh, commercial products, they're one of three types, either a coin cell battery, what's known as a pouch cell, or a cylindrical cell. If you go to Walmart or Radio Shack or, or wherever, uh, Best Buy, and you wanna buy a battery, these are the kinds of batteries you can actually buy. So designers have to design their devices around the batteries rather than batteries being designed around devices. So we asked ourselves, can we print these batteries? And particularly, we always like to take on a challenge when we do things. And so we not only wanted to print a battery that was rechargeable, we, would, we decided we wanted to print a very small battery, a, a, a micro battery. And one of the motivations for that is this image here. This is actually a micro sensor sitting on a coin cell battery. The battery dwarfs the actual device that it's supporting. And this is supposed to be for a, uh, a sensor that one can make airborne, like one of these remote moats. And uh, you can imagine that's not possible with a battery that's so bulky. So we asked ourselves, could we do this? And of course, I wouldn't be telling you about this if we didn't achieve it. Um, but we made these two inks, an anode ink based on lithium titanate oxide and a, a cathode ink, lithium uh, iron phosphate. And then we used our printing approach to uh, create a high aspect ratio out of plane anode. For many of these micro devices, the aerial component is the most important. So that lateral footprint is what you want to minimize, but out of plane you'd like to build higher uh, uh, structures because that gives you more lithium-based battery material and it gives you a higher energy density. 
So you can see this uh, printing happening here through a 30 micron nozzle. Once we print the anode, and then of course we do this in a, in a large series, you can see some connectors between just so that we have a continuous print path. You could start and stop the ink, but we didn't in this path. And this battery is about a millimeter by a millimeter by a half a millimeter in height. It's equivalent to a single grain of sand. Think about that for a minute. Anybody that's put salt on their food tonight, one of those little crystals is a, is a battery that we've just printed. And you can see that now on, the, oh, sorry, on this uh, pencil, just to give you a size for, of the scale. And after we come back in those anode structures and we interdigitate the cathode, we do, in fact, have a working battery. You can see the aerial capacity as a function of cycle numbers, charge and discharge, it actually works. And this is part of the reason why I think we were uh, named as uh, one of the breakthrough technologies in 2014, because this really captured people's imagination. Up until that point, 3D printing was used you know, to make plastic or metal forms, but now we finally had a chance to make something functional. That's the good news. The bad news is at, at when we first did that work, uh, the packaging that we did was uh, used, using just a simple plexiglass, which we uh, CNC milled out a little cavity, filled that cavity with the liquid electrolyte, and packaged the battery. As you can see, we made a nice little battery, but the package is about you know, 9x larger. Uh, so that wasn't so good. So I challenged one of my PhD students, Tenzing Wei, and I said, Tenzing, we got to print everything in the battery. We've got to print the anode, the cathode, the separator, and the packaging material. And so he undertook that and designed four inks and printed this battery It's shown here. This is a square open cell battery. Again, a custom factor, a custom form factor that you wouldn't be able to find commercial off the shelf. And it works. This is a 1.8 volt battery and you can see it hooked up here. Now this also has ultra thick electrodes. So unlike these interdigitated walls that were only 30 microns uh, across, this battery has electrodes that are one millimeter thick on, on, on both the anode and cathode. And the way we did that was to introduce a second particle phase. So not only did we have the cathode nanoparticles and the anode nanoparticles, but we had conductive particles interspersed throughout the uh, two electrodes. And if we look at the performance of these cells, this is, again, aerial capacity because the area is what matters in, the, in these kinds of devices. As a function of current density, we can see where our micro battery sits here, as well as our packaged square cell here, and the square cell in, in just pure form, and that's tested without the, the full packaging. And you can see there's about a 10x improvement. And part of that has, certainly has to do with the fact that we've built higher out of plane and it's a, it, and it's a, a, a higher aspect, aspect ratio battery. But all, also it has to do with the fact that now instead of filling all this space that's empty with the liquid electrolyte, we actually included the liquid electrolyte in the cathode and anode inks that we were printing. So the next story I'd like to introduce is how we can use 3D printing to create soft electronics sensors and robotics, soft robotics that is. And you can see uh, some examples of where these kinds of devices might have technological impact, whether it be in smart textiles or textile mounted sensors, wearables, haptic devices, or implantable uh, and medical devices, or robots that are soft that could go into hazardous zones and, and do search and rescue. So um, when we think about printing soft electronics, let's first think about the electronics that are in our actual devices now. If we take apart our cell phone or our laptop, what we're gonna find is a rigid circuit board with surface mounted electrical components on those and uh, traces, conductive traces that interconnect all of those devices. These are flat, rigid, um, and they're not really amenable for, you know, wearing on, on a textile mounted uh, surface. But we can think about creating objects or electronics that are inherently soft. And one way to do that is to print materials that stretch. And another way to do that is to pattern electrodes that stretch. So pattern geometries that stretch, such as the serpentine, like a spring-like uh, mo motif. We focused on printing materials that stretch both substrates and the conductive electrodes. But in both of these devices, you can see there are still rigid surface-mounted components because these have been engineered quite well. They're very low cost, 
And so we can just take those and pick and place them onto any of these types of motifs. So to create a stretchable matrix in conductive ink, we started with an elastomer. Much like that rubber band-like response that I showed earlier, this elastomer, though, is made out of thermoplastic polyurethane, TPU. And we can use that in, in its pure form to pattern the matrix. And we can add silver flakes that are conductive, or silver platelets, if you will, that are conductive filler particles. Now, you can see a cross-section of one of these traces, and this is an expanded view, showing these individual platelets. They're very thin in form factor, less than a micron, and a few microns in the lateral dimensions. Now, as we print this ink, we have to think about the conductivity as a function of the concentration of the filler that we add. And we also have to think about the fact that these are rigid fillers. So as we increase conductivity by adding ever more of these silver platelets, we're doing so at the sacrifice of the stretchability. So there's an optimal silver content. And in this case, it's about 35% by volume. We have to get above the percolation threshold. We have to have a touching network of these particles to have a conductive path within the trace that we're printing. But if we go too high, we really suppress the stretchability of the, of the, of the uh, printed trace. So let's see this in operation. This is a single trace. We have these two uh, printed pads as well that we're making contact with. You can see, I hope, in the background, the pure elastomer matrix that this electrode is being printed on. And it's connected to this LED. And at a certain point, as we stretch it ever more, you'll see the LED light go off. That's because we've now broke, we've stretched this so much that we've broken up the individual connections between particles and we've broken electrical percolation. We haven't actually mechanically you know, failed the device. So we can repeatedly stretch up to strains of about 150% before we hit this electrical percolation or breaking up of that percolating pathway. So these have the ability to be stretched to about 1.5 times their initial length. And as you can see, as we increase their um, stretch, we increase the electrical resistance because we're breaking up those conductive pathways. Now let's see how we can print a device from these materials. What you first see here is the matrix, the pure matrix, then the electrical traces, the conductive stretchable ink. Then we use the printer in a kind of interesting way. We're using it as a pick and place tool. So we're, instead of having ink coming out of the nozzle under an applied pressure, we're, we're creating a negative pressure and creating a vacuum. And we have these little cassettes that hold our, our LEDs in this case. And we come in with a nozzle and just pick it up. Place it, pick it up. So turn off on a negative pressure, turn off a negative pressure once we place. And then as this device comes out of, off the printer, you can see that it's highly flexible. There are two magnetic connectors here that we can attach um, our electrodes to and uh, our, our wires to to pass electricity through. And then if we go to the next slide, you can see this device in operation. This is in the form of a Harvard H. And each one of these is an LED that we've picked and placed and printed and connected to our printed uh, electrical traces. OK, that was just a proof of concept. Now let's do something a little more sophisticated. Here we're going to marry a soft strain sensor. We're going to take advantage of the fact that as you stretch these electrodes, there's a change of resistance. And we're going to marry that with an electrical circuit now that contains a microcontroller that will take the readout from the sensor, the output, the change in resistance, and convert that to an LED readout. So again, I'll show this just printing very quickly. The first thing we do is put down some adhesive droplets. Then we start to put a row of LEDs, five LEDs, uh, five resistors. You'll start to see this circuit continue to build up a little faster. We then put down a microchip. Then we come in and we print the soft strain sensor. So this is this uh, sensor here. And it's now you're going to see us come back in and print all the interconnects. So that's the device. And it's on a, you know, a substrate. So we can mount this onto um, a textile mounted, um, uh, in, a, in a textile mounted fashion. And you can see that the strain sensor is sitting on the joint of, of my student's elbow. <laughs> and as he bends his elbow, the strain increases. And you see the LEDs light up. 
And as he comes back to an unbent form, all of the LEDs, LEDs go down. Now, that might be very useful for monitoring, for example, in rehab, a patient's motion, right? Whether they've got a knee replacement, how their, motion, how their uh, range of motion is evolving as they do rehab. And so that's one of the reasons that we pursued these kinds of device architectures. Now, the next thing I'd like to describe is beyond printing and the two printing methods, one can also do a lot with the print head designs themselves. And so the idea here is to create novel print heads that will allow us to print multiple materials. In this case, this is a multi-nozzle, multi-material array. It's a four by four array being printed. And you can see that four different materials are being co-printed sort of in a voxel-wise manner. We've also designed adaptive nozzle arrays that can go over curvilinear surfaces, much like you ski over moguls. Each one of these individual nozzles is being actuated out of plane, and we have a surface polarometer that uh, uh, extends ahead of the head that first reads the topography and then deposits the ink accordingly. And then lastly, we've recently introduced a new multi-material rotation nozzle where we can bring multiple materials together inside a given print head. And instead of just printing them out as, as single uh, filaments, we can print them out in such a way that we have a helicoidal structure within these filaments. So we could have conductive materials intertwining with, for example, stretchable uh, dielectric matrices. But I don't have time to describe all of these, so I'm gonna focus on our multi-material, multi-nozzle arrays. And this is really a, a, an, an integration of two separate advances in our lab. One that focused on switching, high-speed switching, between two inks in a single nozzle, as shown here, which we can do at switching frequencies up to 50 hertz. And if anyone's ever watched a hummingbird wing flap, those flap at about 80 hertz. So this is indeed quite fast. And the second innovation was these um, multi-nozzle arrays. This is a single composition coming out where one single inlet of ink is bif keeps bifurcating through different generations to have 64 filaments ultimately coming out. So in that case, if we were printing with a single nozzle, we get a 64x enhancement in print speed because now we're laying down 64 filaments at once. So integrating these two allows us to do some kind of cool things. But we should first think about what is the, how do we have to think about applying pressure to these materials and why are viscoelastic inks necessary? So as I said before, when you have a viscous ink going through a nozzle, it breaks up into droplets, much like when you turn on your faucet and, 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 and your water breaks up into droplets, right? This is due to a Rayleigh plateau instability. If we have our viscoelastic inks in these nozzles and we just have two inks coming in, if we have the appropriately applied pressure, we get that single ink stream coming down. And this is what we want. We want a stable interface here because we want to be able to rapidly switch between materials. And we want that junction to remain stable. We don't want backflow of one ink into the reservoir of the other. If we apply too much pressure, what happens is, as you'll see over time, we exceed the yield stress of this ink and the red ink flows into that blue region. And so if we go through all of the um, sort of uh, electrical analogs of the pressure diagrams, what we find is there's a critical flow rate for the material that we're trying to dispense. If we exceed that, we get backflow. If we stay below that, we don't. So we can do with 3D printing, we can make all of these different kinds of nozzle designs. So now we're using 3D printing design nozzles for 3D printing, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, here we use stereolithography to make internal architectures within the nozzles. And you can see that we have really, like I said before, a wide variety of design freedom. So we can go with the simplest one nozzle with two materials, eight nozzles with two, with, uh, two materials, or we can start doing uh, you know, two by, you know, a four by four a two dimensional nozzle array, or up to as many as 128 nozzles. We can also vary the number of materials that are fed through these branching architectures, which are internal inside the nozzle, up to a maximum of eight different materials we can switch between. <clears throat> 
So what does that look like in practice? This is one of our 1D nozzle arrays with eight nozzles and four different materials. You can see these four different materials, blue, uh, red, yellow, and green. And you can see each one of those are delivered, all four, to the same nozzle. Now when I turn this movie on, you're gonna start to see this stream of filaments coming down, and we're switching again at different speeds. And when we go to the highest switching speed of 50, uh, the highest switching frequency, I should say, of 50 hertz, the individual, voc the individual uh, switching, the elements that are coming out that are going from material A to material B and so forth, the length of that voxel is essentially the diameter of the nozzle. So now we're being able to print materials in a voxel-wise fashion where the voxel uh, volume is essentially the length times the diameter squared approximately. So how can, we, how can we take advantage of this capability? Well, I'm just gonna give one sort of, I think, cute example, and this is to use it to print soft robots. So here we're printing both stiff and flexible elastomeric inks. In this case, they're made out of silicone. And we're printing them into this kind of architecture. And underneath each of these uh, soft and uh, rigid uh, uh, silicone inks, we have a pneumatic network. So we're printing in open channels that can be used, again, by pull pulling a vacuum or pressurizing to cause the flexible material to collapse and the rigid material to just go with that. So kind of think about the flexible material as a muscle and the rigid material as a bone. So just like when we walk, our muscles allow us to propel, that's what's happening with the flexible material. And you can see stress versus strain here. The stiffness is, is much harder, larger than the flexible material. So let's see what happens when we use these multi-nozzle arrays, multi-material arrays to print this device. You can see the base is being printed here. You can see open regions where we have cavities where we're gonna have the pneumatic pressure to drive the device. And now we start to build up the um, out of plane features that give it uh, the ability to, to walk or to locomote. And you can see the, the uh, outer rigid features and the flexible materials being co-printed. And um, the inner features, the flexible is on one side, the outer features, the flexible ink is on the other side. So this is what it looks like in practice. Um, it's upside down right now. Um, it's having a nice time. Uh, maybe it's at Radio City Music Hall. I don't know. <laughs> but uh, you know, and now it's uh, now it's doing its thing, right? It's it's carrying uh, our, our labware uh, across a, a bench. Um, but you get the idea. Um, it's a, it's a cute demonstration, but it gives you a sense of what one can do with multi-material, multi-nozzle printing. We can put any material where we want it on demand in a voxelized manner. Why did this go? Okay, all right, so in the time that remains, I'd like to switch gears and talk about human tissues and ultimately our goal is to create organs. I should point out that as you go deeper and deeper below the depth of the, of the surface in this iceberg, uh, the difficulty in making these objects gets ever more complex and harder. And so organs are, are most definitely the grand challenge. We are not in a West world yet, for those of you who know that TV show. Um, so we're taking a, a first cut at organ-specific human tissues, as I said, with the ultimate goal to get into organs. So let me tell you why it's important that we are able to create human tissues and organs. First of all, from the perspective of human tissues, we need these to be able to test drugs. Um, right now, the uh, pharma industry spends over $20 billion a year on drugs that never reach the market. They fail in phase uh, one, two, or three clinical trials. And often they don't fail to phase three, meaning all of the sunk cost has been spent up front. What we posit is that having human tissues to test drugs on will allow us to have a phase zero fail fast process. And the reason why that's important is because right now what pharmaceutical industry does is they do 2D high throughput screens on cells that are in a dish. Our body is three dimensional. Our, our, we don't have cells in a dish in our body. We have cells in three dimensional niches that represent our tissues. And then after they do the high throughput screens on a 2D dish, they go into animal models. Unfortunately, we are also not animal models. <laughs> they, we don't, they don't always align 
oftentimes they're not predictive. And that allows certain drugs that pass through screens on animals to get into phase, phase one, phase two, phase three trials that would not pass on a more realistic human tissue. So can we have that testing done in a phase zero fail fast way? And in fact, the FDA passed a modernization act in, uh, in December of 2022, so just this past December, that allows for the first time for pharma companies to bring preclinical packages to get authorization to do clinical trials based solely on human data, human cells in a dish, human tissues in three dimensions. Now that's one reason why we should care about being able to create these tissues that emulate and recapitulate our tissues in our body. The second sort of longer term home run swing is because organs are needed, okay? There's an ever growing gap between human organ donors and those that need organs. And the most prevalent and the most organ in need is the kidney. So across the world, there's about 800,000 people that are waiting for a kidney. Uh, many of them, of course, are on dialysis. Dialysis is a, is a disease in and of itself. After five years on dialysis, you're, you're, you're you know, predicted to have your own mortality. So if you haven't received a donor organ within five years, you're most likely gonna die. Um, but in addition to that, in many cases, you don't actually need a whole organ. You need a piece of an organ that provides function, that repairs just enough or provides just enough function to restore. So for example, if you were on, on dialysis, you only need to have a glomerular filtration rate increase of about 10 to 15%. You don't need a whole organ to get off dialysis. If you have a myocardial infarction, a heart attack, you don't need a whole heart. In fact, only about 50,000 people in the whole world need a, a full heart. You just need a piece of cardiac tissue that can go in and repair the damaged region. So our goal has been to create patient-specific tissues, both for modeling as well as for repair, therapeutic use, that function. And while we're working on both kidney and cardiac, tonight I'm just gonna focus on cardiac tissue engineering. So I think we all know that our hearts perform quite a vital function without which we would not be alive. Um, they uh, pump blood and that blood carries oxygen and nutrients through our, our circulatory network. And uh, we have you know, a heartbeat frequency uh, about once every second, right? But many of you, perhaps in this room, um, know people or perhaps have been unfortunate enough to have a heart attack yourself. Over eight million Americans have. Uh, uh, so many of us are in that situation. And when you have a heart attack, you lose roughly a billion cells within your myocardium. So this is your heart muscle, the myocardium. It's about a one centimeter thick structure. This is the muscle that contracts, that does the pumping. And if these cells die because you get a clogged artery and nutrients are not getting into that region, they can never be restored, okay? You have to inject new cells in or replace that tissue. There's no rejuvenation of your cardiac uh, cells. So once they die, that region is no longer functional. And ultimately, oftentimes, this progresses to heart failure. And in fact, roughly 10% of, 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 of all of us in this room will die from, from heart failure. So if we wanna think about printing, okay, not a whole heart, but even part of a heart tissue, we have to think about all of the challenges that uh, we have to overcome. First of all, um, our tissues are quite cellularly dense. We have roughly 100 or more million cells per milliliter in our tissues. We also have roughly 100 billion cells per organ. So our heart is roughly the size of my fist. It turns out a kidney is also roughly the size of my fist. And we need about 100 billion cells to replace the whole thing. If, as we think about replacing just uh, the damage to local tissue, in, a, in your heart, we only need a billion cells. Okay, that's, that's good news, but it's still a lot of cells. Um, and many uh, of our organs contain many different cell types. Um, so ultimately, if we're gonna do whole organ engineering, we have to be able to pattern you know, tens of cell types in order to recapitulate the full function. 
In addition, we have a complexity across lane scale. So at the sort of centimeter and larger lane scale, this is what a cut would look like through our left and right ventricle, showing the myocardium, as I said, which is about a centimeter thick. If we were to zoom in and look at the, the myocardium itself, the heart muscle itself, it's made of cardiomyocytes. Those are the cells, they assemble into myofibrils, and that's what gives the contractility. And then if we go into each cell and we look at what's happening in these myofibrils and at the cellular level, what we see are sarcomeres. And that's really the local machinery at the micron scale and lower that's giving rise to the contraction. And then ultimately, if we're gonna make a thick tissue, something like on the order of a centimeter or even less, we have to have vasculature. We have to be able to embed vasculature within this densely cellular construct in order to keep the cells alive. And in fact, typically cells must reside within a few hundred microns of each of the blood supply because they need the oxygen and they need the nutrients, without which you can't build a tissue that's more than a few hundred microns thick. That's not gonna do much from the perspective of therapeutic use. It may be sufficient for some of the pharmaceutical type screening applications. So fortunately, in 2007, there was another big discovery that was Nobel Prize worthy from uh, Shinya Yakama, uh, Yamanaka's group in, in uh, Japan. And he devised a way to start with adult cells, so our skin cells, our blood cells, and reprogram them back to an induced pluripotent state. At the embryonic level, we start as you know, in our embryonic state with embryonic stem cells, and they have pluripotency. They can differentiate into any of our 300 cell types in our body, right? These induced pluripotent stem cells can do the same. They can differentiate into the ectoderm, the mesoderm, or the endoderm, and you can see the heart uh, lies in the mesoderm. So the beautiful thing about this is we can take a patient's own cells, right? And we can take a blood sample or a skin sample, use that discovery to reprogram them back into a pluripotent state, and then we can differentiate them by giving them cues, much like they would be exposed to in the embryonic state, and drive them towards things like cardiomyocytes, our muscle cells in the heart, endothelial cells, which we need to line the vasculature. Those could be used for drug screening so that we unlock personalized medicine, medicine that's dialed in directly for your needs, for how your body responds, or for things like understanding disease modeling, or for things like we're interested in, using those for regenerative therapeutic use assemble these cells into larger aggregates that then get assembled into tissues that ultimately can be implanted into humans and restore function. So let me convince you, first of all, that we really do need these blood vessels. If we start with induced pluripotent stem cells, first of all, we culture them in two dimensions, although we can also culture them into bioreactors in 3D and what's called suspension culture. We then create a large amount of aggregates these are like granular building blocks. You think back to the battery that's a millimeter in size. These are about a half a millimeter in diameter. These aggregates contain 100,000 cells. So every one of these little organ building blocks is what we call them, contain tens if not hundreds of thousands of cells. And then we take that suspension and we essentially consolidate them into a densely cellular living tissue matrix. And if we don't put any vasculature into this living tissue matrix, and this is just a simple cube that's about four millimeters on a side, which has very high cell density of 200 million cells per milliliter, and then we do what's called a live dead stain and we look, take a cut through that tissue and we see what cells are alive and what cells are dead. And this is sitting in a media, this is surrounded by a media that has oxygen and nutrients to keep the cells alive. You can see that only on the tissue periphery are these aggregates, again, each of which contains tens of thousands of cells, only on the periphery are those cells largely alive, stained in green, denoting that they're living. Those in the core are dead, okay? So the next step was how do we convert that block of tissue that has no vasculature into a block of tissue that does. And we um, 
created a method that we call SWIFT, sacrificial writing in functional tissue, where like akin to the embedded printing method I showed before, we can come down and create a branching architecture um, in this densely cellular tissue. So everywhere you see red ink being printed, that's a sacrificial ink. Once that ink is erased, we open up a lumen, a channel, just like in our blood vessels. And those per lumens can be perfused. You can see an inlet and an outlet. So we can flow media or blood through those open lumens. So we have the ability to embed vascular networks within these functional tissues. So let's see how this works in practice. What I'm gonna show next is a movie. It's being imaged from below, above which we have this living matrix. You can see here the individual organ building blocks. They're all jammed together in a densely cellular way. Now the first thing that you're gonna see when, when this movie plays is an empty nozzle. There's no ink being uh, deposited, but you can see how this tissue matrix flows around this nozzle. It's, it has some mobility, it's viscoelastic. It can flow under the shear when the nozzle's passing, but once the nozzle goes through, it locks in place. Now, here we see the red ink. Everywhere you see red will ultimately be an open channel. Now, there's about half a billion cells in this tissue. Remember I said for, you know, to repair uh, uh, damage to a cardiac, uh, for, from a, a heart attack, we only need about a billion cells. So we've already been able to achieve the types of cell densities that one, and the types of cell numbers that one needs to, to carry out that uh, repair. So when we look at a tissue cross-section now that has these printed lumens, after we remove the ink, so here's the ink there, after we remove it, we have these empty channels. You can see that depending on the print pressure, we can change the diameter of the printed vessel on the fly. And now you see much more living tissue all the way across the cross-section of the, of the heart. And you're always gonna have some dead cells. This here is about 10% dead cells uh, in this tissue. And that's typical when you do bioprinting. There's always some cell death. Now, let's think about now creating these cardiomyocytes that are the functional building blocks, the functional cells in our, our myocardium, in our heart muscle. Here we relied on a protocol developed by um, Sean Palasik's group at the University of Wisconsin. It begins with the same induced pluripotent stem cells we go into these uh, flasks, T flasks, and then you can see these aggregates, these organ building blocks that are clusters of many cells together. And then um, you can see uh, over time, these, these clusters uh, change from more of a spherical morphology to a more uh, you know, non uh, Egliax morphology. But if we look inside each one of these, we can see from staining that we indeed have cardiomyocytes. We're staining for caltroponin. Now, interestingly, if you look closely at this video, each one of these little building blocks is beating. Yes. It's a cardiomyocyte. Each one of these is a cluster of cells. And because it's relatively immature, because we started with an induced pluripotent state, let me go back and, and play that again. Let me see if I can just come back in. You can see them all beating, right? Okay, so that's not a tissue yet, right? All we have is a bunch of individual beating uh, blobs, if you will. Um, but now let's look what happens when we start to jam those together to form that contiguous tissue. On day one, you can still see the individual building blocks and they're still beating asynchronously. They're not beating in unison, like we need to have them beat inside us for when we want to pump blood efficiently. But by day eight, First of all, you can even see visually that there's been a change in density, a change in volume, there's been contraction. These individual building blocks have fused together. Now the tissue is beating synchronously, beating with more force. There's maturation, there's synchronization. And if we look again deep into the tissue, we see these sarcomeric features that are giving rise to the beating. And we also see microvessels. We didn't print these. We added endothelial cells to these building blocks and they spontaneously formed little capillaries. So we have the ability to print large vessels and ultimately hook them up to little capillaries. Now, let's take a look at what's happening in the tissue using a calcium dye. 
Uh, let me go back, because that went super fast. Um, day, day one, right? Remember, it's asynchronous. There should be lots of you know, activity everywhere. You can see this is not beating like a contiguous tissue. By day seven, they fuse together, and it's starting to have one synchronous beat after the other. Uh, if we look at just two spots and track, again, you can see the asynchronous uh, spontaneous beating. By day seven, you can see that their different regions are beating spontaneously together in unison. And then we can actually electrically pace this. Our heart is actually electrically paced internally by a special type of cell called the Purkin G cell. And so if we pace this at one hertz, you can see that this tissue is beating together across the entire tissue. Importantly, these tissues also respond to cardio-effective drugs. So these are drugs that are given to cardiac patients to either increase their beat frequency if they have bradycardia, or to slow down their uh, amplitude of beating in this case. And you can see that the tissue responds. This is the nascent tissue before we've in perfused drugs through that vascular network. And this is what happens after. In both cases, the heart tissue is responding much like it would in vivo, the way our native tissue would respond. So we're far away from implanting these tissues in patients. I'll so tell you that right now. It's a long road. First in man studies are many years out. But I want to at least tell you that we have the ability to start with cells that are made from you, for you, using these induced pluripotent cells. That's important because there won't be a rejection of the tissue because they're from your own cells. And secondly, we can take files like this that are on the 3D print NIH uh, database that are patient-specific scans of your heart tissue, and we can print regions that might have been damaged from a cardiac event. And so this is just a mold that shows one region here where we've come in and we have them filled with our cardiac building blocks and we're printing the type of vasculature that you can see uh, imaged. And so that's, that's kind of where we're going. Um, we have, as I said, activities in cardiac tissue manufacturing, kidney tissue, as well as neural tissue. And our focus is really to create these cellularly dense tissues that are vascularized and that function, that exhibit the kinds of function that your native tissues function. So I'd like to end by just coming back to our iceberg. I hope I've convinced you that there's a lot of potential for 3D printing to do more than just simple shapes and complex shapes uh, in, in, in Taylor form. Um, it's very true that this digital manufacturing platform will become ever more used to make final parts rather than just prototypes. Um, Advances that are coming out of our own lab, as well as many others, are enabling, for the first time, form integrated with function. And finally, printing human tissues and organs is within reach, but their integration in, in vivo um, is still several years away. Um, and it requires more effort. It requires a, a cascade of things, starting with implanting them in animal models, small animal models, then larger animal models, and ultimately into first in man. So with that, I'd like to first thank some of the recent alumni. Those that are involved here have contributed to the work that I'm showing today in some way. Um, many of them are now in faculty positions. And last night when I got to meet uh, 10 of the scholarship winners, I found out that four of them are going to institutions where I have former postdocs or graduate students now on the faculty, and that was a lot of fun. I almost went five for five at one table, but I just didn't quite have, a, a, I couldn't quite do that. There was one university where I don't have a, a student or postdoc. And then also, we've had a lot of people come out of our lab that have gone into startups and um, uh, industry, and they were really central. They bought in uh, to our vision of bioprinting at a, at a time when um, I, as a material science, was really drinking from the, the fire hose of biology. Um, I'd also like to thank our current group, shown here, and a number of our collaborators. I've listed every collaborator here. Uh, none, not all of them have contributed to the work that I've shared today, but as um, you might have gotten the impression from, from uh, the introduction, we do many, many things in our lab. So I just picked four examples, and I hope I've given you a snapshot of the things that we do.
And then with that, I'd also like to thank the, the numerous uh, funding uh, sources without which we can't do anything. Um, and lastly, I'd like to thank you. Thank you for your attention. Again, thank you for the kind invitation. And I look forward to interacting with you at the reception. Thank you so much. So as a uh, tradition of the J. Robert Oppenheim Memorial, we would like to present you with a commemorative medallion with our thanks. Wow. <laughs> um, but first I'd like to share the provenance of this medallion. So you'll get it in just a second. Okay, no worries. <laughs> This commemorative medallion was designed by the late Santa Fe artist Una uh, Anbury. The profile of J. Robert Oppenheimer is adapted from a bust of Oppenheimer that Anbury executed in 1973. The bust was commissioned by the Los Alamos National Laboratory and is on display at the laboratory's Oppenheimer Study Center. A second cast is in the collection of the Smithsonian Institution's National Portrait Gallery in Washington, D.C. The third and final cast, considered the artist's copy, was obtained by the J. Robert Oppenheimer Memorial Committee and is on long-term loan at the uh, Los Alamos History Museum. So um, I'd like to present this to you. <laughs> OK, let me go over here. <laughs> Picture time. <laughs> oh, wow. Thank you. You can take it out if you want. Okay, sure. I don't know. Great. Here you go. <laughs> it's beautiful. Thank you so much. Now I have to put it in the right place. Yes. Thank you. Go. Thank you so much. So before we adjourn to the reception next door, please join us. Um, let me remind you to fill out uh, the survey provided in the program and. Please return to the table in the lobby. So again, thank you for your attendance, and I look forward to seeing you at the reception. Thank you again. Thanks. Thanks. <laughs> thank you. I'm just going to put this here for a second. Thank you.